Hi, I'm DJ Ware. Today I'd like to talk a little bit about some suggestions I have for Linux. And this has mostly to do with software and all that kind of stuff that could be done, hopefully to make it more palatable for someone new coming from one of the two big proprietary operating systems for the first time. So my suggestions, or I mean, these aren't mandates. These are the things that I think Linux really falls short in. And some of the things that I think that we could do as uh, developers within the Linux community and users in the Linux community to, to encourage the distros that produce, uh, the distro builders that produce Linux with some, some things that we think that they should do. That, and the top on my list is enhanced software compatibility. That is, that isn't making the versions of Linux compatible, but rather trying to reach out to these companies that have popular software applications and offering to help port their software over to Linux because a lot of them just, we need to collaborate better with these software vendors to provide official Linux support and mechanisms to allow them to move their software. I think that, you know, think, tools like Wine and Proteon do a great job in trying to make Windows applications more supportable on Linux, but they could do better. I mean, I mean, yeah, they, they definitely could do better. The second thing, number two, we need to streamline the installation and setup. I have seen some really good installation uh, mechanisms, you know, um, I've always been harsh on Canonical, but the last version of Ubuntu that they did using Flutter is way easier to install that distribution onto a desktop than Debian, for example, or even Fedora. The, they, you know, it would be really cool if there was a simple, consistent way that they could brand to their own needs and yet make it look and feel the same uh, as far as the steps are concerned and being able to get uh, things like having the options for partitioning or dual booting, disk encryption, all set up during installation. Also, a guided setup for connecting to Wi-Fi networks configuring printers and maybe other peripherals that a user may be plugging in. Audio cards for one might be one of them. Cameras may be another. So, but to simplify all that and to keep them out of the command line. Three, improve hardware support. We, you know, it's funny that, uh, that we have worked on these standards for hardware to allow vendors to have interchangeable parts with PCI, USB, uh, some of the new emerging standards that are coming, uh, in, you know, even the older ones like Thunderbolt and uh, or OC Link and some of the newer ones that are coming that allow us to interchange the hardware between different computer systems. But none of us have sat down to figure out why can't we build a standard hardware driver that will run on Windows, that will run on Mac OS, that will run on BSD, and that will run on Linux. I just, I, I don't understand that. It's all software. I don't understand why the, there is a hardware abstraction layer. We can make it look like anything we want. Why can't that driver be standard? Why do I need to write one specifically for Windows, specifically for Mac, specifically for Linux, and then allow it to run. That's one of the biggest barriers that Linux has today. I'm sure that even Macs run into this problem because it's a walled garden. They control what hardware is supported on those platforms. Also, to develop open source drivers and firmware when possible so that they can be shared easily without having a license restriction. You know, if you consider the life of this hardware, most of it is replaced every year. So 
having it clutched to your your chest and protecting it. Some of the hardware compatible compatibility lists are maintained. Again, I mean, I've spoken badly of uh, Canonical in the past, but they do keep up their hardware compatibility list. I noticed Fedora's is, I think the last time that one looks like it's been updated is 2019. In fact, I even saw one on a third party that was that was uh, you know attempting to pick up the HCL and and create less uh, that would work for various versions of Fedora, but you know it really needs to come from the the guys that are doing the kernel. Four, focusing on gaming, uh, promote and support Linux on as a gaming engine. Now that's being done. Uh, we have the the we have Steam doing it now. Asus is moving into this this platform, but will Asus use Linux? Linux could could offer additional support for compatible layers uh, like DXVX, which is a uh, that is an, a middleware for providing compatibility with Vulkan. You could do more even with DirectX, DirectX 11 and 10 and 12, all of those. One of the biggest barriers is that you know Windows and Linux, Mac, Mac is gone. They're off of 32-bit standards. Uh, there is no, I mean, all those games that were written for 32-bit at some point in time will no longer run. I mean, that's just the reality of it. But there would be it would be interesting to create abstraction layers using KVM that would allow those 32-bit applications to still run. There's a lot of people that still run older games. So, but and sh but the other thing it would be really neat would be to ensure that popular gaming platforms like Steam have well integrated Linux versions. I, I I don't know about you, but I've looked through some of the documentation on Steam for Linux. It isn't that well integrated. It's it's kind of a bolt on and pray uh, from what I can see. It's better than it was, yes, no doubt. But yeah, it's not what I would would say would be sitting down, figuring out where those integration links are. The less emulation you can have, the faster the game will run closer you can get it to hardware. Five, user-friendly desktop environments. Invest in a user interface and user experience design to create a polished, intuitive desktop environment. Does that mean we need to start over? I don't think so. There's a number of them. I mean, I'm not saying I would be, it would be really cool if we could get down to one, one desktop environment, but that's not likely. In fact, there's probably more that are in the wings that are coming. You can't get through the blockade of an existing project. I mean, that's typical is that the developers will blockade new ideas because they already have their mindset, their direction, and the way they want a UI and UX to work. But the one thing that none of us are really considering is cross-platform. We're not considering things like tablets and phones uh, in addition to the desktop. The, the, the desktop, I think, will be dead by 2030. I don't think there will be one. I think, it, I mean, the, most people today access the Internet with their phone. There's, there's still a few of us that are using desktops uh, for work and maybe for uh, gaming and maybe for video production, but the the tools are coming down quickly onto tablets for video production. Uh, I've looked at uh, the latest uh, enhancements for DaVinci Resolve on iPad. It's amazing what you can do with a very th small device that you can basically carry like a book and use it to create videos. Number six, stability and performance. Those two things usually do not go hand in hand. They're usually diametrically opposed because the more you push the machine into performing, the less st stable it generally becomes uh, because you start heating up components, you start, uh, you start pushing voltages up a bit, and then things break. So, yeah. But... We want to prioritize the stability and performance in the desktop environments 
as well as those components that go in to the system that communicates with hardware and other devices that are on the box. Also, we want to optimize system resources and make sure that uh, it's smooth performance on as wide a range of hardware as possible. Seven, software repositories. It would be nice if we could maintain a common base of well-maintained software repos with a wide variety of up-to-date applications. That way, the developers would only have to post once. Eight, what about security and updates? Uh, we need to implement automated security updates to keep the system secure. Uh, I don't know if you update on what frequency you update your systems, if at all, once you have them. But most of them today will will post nags that hey, you've got security, you've got updates that you need to do. The other side of the coin is longer term support versions of both the operating systems, which we have today, and the LTS versions of the applications, which are maintained by the distributions, which seems odd to me. Uh, because an LTS version that's maintained by Canonical might not be the same as an LTS version that's maintained by Debian. In other words, they may not be the same version. Why do we do that? Number nine, documentation and support. So documentation probably isn't as big a deal as it used to be. Most people get their educations today from videos, which is kind of a weird way to go because videos take longer to consume than reading a, a manual. So, I mean, that's just a fact. We, we looked at that years and years ago. Uh, uh, video, watching a video, you're locked to the time frame that the video takes to cover the material. Whereas if you're reading the same material, uh, you can cover the ground almost 10 times to 100 times faster, depending upon your level of reading ability and comprehension. But yeah, it's just not the fastest way to learn. But sometimes it's, it's a better way to see it you know, and actually, actually see someone act it out than it is to just read it, too. Because the tendency is to skip a step, break something, and then wonder what happened. Uh, the other one is to um, foster an active and responsive user community that has forums and support channels. And standardization and collaboration. Collaborate with other Linux distributions and desktop environments to establish common standards and improve its inoperability uh, between other applications. Uh, a plug-in architecture is usually desirable when you're building apps. That was the whole reason behind the pipe and filter architecture of Unix and Linux to start with, was to allow applications to plug in and be reused in ways that the original designer hadn't even thought about. But work on initiatives that address fragmentation while preserving choice. That's a tough thing to do. Accessibility. <laughs> hey, thank you, Dan. So tell us your story a little bit. So I started to lose my hearing in my 20s. And when I turned 30, I tried a hearing aid. And it was magical. To lose a sense and gain it back again feels like gaining a superpower. And ever since that moment, I've been on a hunt for ways that technology can augment human capabilities and give us superpowers. And that's what led me to Rewind. So what's Rewind doing? So Rewind is a personalized AI powered by everything you've seen, said, or heard. The way it works is it captures your screen and your audio, it compresses it, encrypts it, transcribes it, and stores it all locally on your PC. And then, best of all, you can ask any question of anything you've seen, said, or heard. Well, that's super cool. And uh, earlier, we talked about this age of the AI PC beginning now, you know, and this ability to capture everything you see here and, you know, be able to transcribe, analyze. Uh, but, you know, I mean, talking about it, can you show me? Sure, I have a machine. Let's go. Okay, let's, let's go take out. a look here. All right, here's Rewind. And to show you how it works, I'm going to pull up uh, the timeline. This is what many of us were probably doing last night, looking around and seeing different sessions we might want to attend here at the conference. I can just rewind back and forth in time like a DVR. But the real power comes from asking questions. So here, I'm going to ask Rewind, when and where uh, is the session on chatbots? 
And what Rewind's going to do, it's going to go back through my memories, things I've captured on my machine, okay. and we'll find that exact moment. Here it says it's the session on chatbots entitled Demystifying Generative AI. Uh, show up to it. It's tomorrow, uh, 12.45 p.m. Uh, it'll be in Clubhouse B, and it'll, here's a little summary of, of the oh, actual session. Hey, hey, that's super cool. And this is leveraging Core and OpenVINO, right? Yeah, so the, the, what I showed you here today was using GPT-4. But okay. what's even better oh. is if we could do this entirely locally. So for the first time ever, I'm going to show you a demo of a personalized AI powered entirely locally on your AI PC using OpenVINO. So let me switch our mode here from GPT-4 to OpenVINO. OK, so now everything's going to run locally. Yeah, and actually, to prove it to you, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to actually turn off our Wi-Fi. So okay. hopefully this will work. I'm going to turn off the Wi-Fi. OK, we're going to brick it. You know, because yeah, of, yeah, so this machine is entirely off of the network. And I'm going to ask a you know, very simple question. What is Pat's favorite sound? OK. So now we're running locally, right, using OpenVINO Ultra, Core Ultra. Right. Exactly. Right. Yes. And so it's, it's going to it's going to take the data that's from your, oops, excuse me, try that one more time. Uh, it's going to take data that's from the machine. And here you can see it knows okay. that your favorite sound is your granddaughter's voice calling you Papa. Okay. Very good. So this is one of the topics that always seems to um, come last. Computers and applications and desktop environments, which are accessible to users with disabilities is an important thing to always have. 12, localization and internationalization support. There's been an awful lot of progress that's been done in this uh, over the past 20 years or so since it really started to gain focus. Avec ses composants d'intelligence artificielle pour fonctionner efficacement en temps réel et réduire la charge sur le CPU. Uh, so, uh, our, our no, I'm back here oh. now, right? And Diane was helping and we were chatting, but you were talking in French when I was gone? Yes, yeah, sorry, Pat. I was explaining the demo in French. Oh, okay. sorry. <laughs> so, uh, so now, not only am I getting real-time summarization of what I missed when I went out of Zoom, right? It brings me back to focus mode when I'm back to the PC, and it also did translation from French in real time as well. Courage translation efforts for both the system and the user-facing applications. This is my point. What about edu 13? What about educational initiatives? You know, education has always been the key to getting people to use new technologies. That if you're if you get the systems into the educational process, chances are that's going to be the system that particular person uses as they progress through their life. So unless there's some compelling reason for them to change. But creating educational programs and initiatives to introduce Linux to new users and IT professionals, uh, yeah, that, that's important in order to have both people that understand Linux that want to use Linux. Now, I'm talking about for the desktop. There's already educational programs for Linux in the IT professions, uh, in the servers realms. User feedback. Actively seek and respond to user feedback and bug reports to address issues promptly. Also involve the community in decision-making processes that help them uh, participate in the planning of new features. Those require focus groups that are time-consuming, but I think it's far better than trying to add telemetry to every piece of software that's coming out to track what we do to understand how we use their software. The thing that bothers me about telemetry is that it can also be used for nefarious purposes to track what you're doing. The logo, the mascot, the, the Tux Penguin. This thing has been around for 27 years now. Yeah, I know the story. Linus was bit by a, a penguin in Australia years and years ago. I'm sure that penguin is long dead. And to me, that logo communicates that we're not serious. In summary, Improving Linux for the desktop, I think it's going to require a combination of technical enhancements, user-centric design, collaboration, and effective communication between the developers, the planners, and the users, maybe just some key users. Distribution developers should strive to create a compelling and user-friendly alternative to the proprietary operating systems 
and try to maintain the core principles of open source choice and customization, which are the things that I particularly enjoy about Linux, and I'm sure that you do as well. And that with that, that's all I had for today. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like and subscribe. Hope to see you all again soon. Bye for now.